We good to start? Yeah, yeah, we're recording now. All right. Rob, over to you. Cool. Um, so uh, first off, I, I really appreciate uh, the invite to, to speak with you all. Um, my name is Rob Wilmoth. I'm a chief architect within Red Hat's North America telecommunications sector. I've been with the company for almost 14 years now. I started out in the support organization. Uh, so, you know, front lines answering the phones and then moved into a uh, sales organization where I basically simply wanted a little bit more of a proactive uh, relationship. And, and furthermore, uh, you know, it, those of you who have done the support role before or, or even the architecture role, uh, you find that you, you get to answer the question, but you never really know what happened next. And uh, my curiosity just got the better of me. I wanted to know what happened next. Uh, so Christoph invited me to uh, to talk to you guys a little bit about you know the the CentOS project announcement, Red Hat developer, and and things like that. Uh, I know there's some some fairly seasoned vets on the phone or on the bridge, uh, so I'm not going to necessarily uh, walk through every single slide that I've got. If you have specific questions, please do feel free to interrupt me. And uh, just as a quick time check, um, I unfortunately have another meeting at 7:30 tonight. Um, so I will only have about 30 minutes. I can go a, a few minutes over, uh, but uh, that other meeting, fortunately I'm not leading it, but uh, I still have to be there. Um, and just as a point of reference, I am nowhere near Boston. Uh, I'm actually down in the uh, Raleigh, North Carolina area, uh, somewhat reasonably close to, uh, to Red Hat's headquarters. So a little bit of, uh, of history, you know, back in the day, um, we initially were doing all of our development of Red Hat Enterprise Linux based on Fedora. Uh, we were taking things from the, the fast moving uh, Fedora and pulling it into Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Obviously that is, is great to establish a business model on. However, with the pace and speed of Fedora, it made it real hard for any anybody who was actively developing toward uh, something that they wanted to stabilize on for enterprise use, uh, it, it kind of made it like you were trying to jump on a, a moving, uh, well, really a, a bullet being fired from a gun. Um, the CentOS model kind of slowed that pace down to uh, trying to jump on a moving crane, uh, which is a little bit nicer. Uh, but uh, the reality was that when you develop something in CentOS, you're still left with the task of uh, submitting it all the way back upstream to Fedora and then figuring out how long it's going to be before a Red Hat Enterprise release cadence picks it up and moves forward. So Stream came along uh, a little over a year ago, and it's, it's something that internally we've, we've wanted to, to get to market for our ISV partners and the people who are actively developing against them for Red Hat Enterprise Linux uh, for a while now, simply because it, it, you know, gave them a place or gave those particular ISVs and IHVs a place to develop on what was coming in Red Hat Enterprise Linux and a much faster pace than having to go all the way back to Fedora to get whatever they were working on pulled in. Now, obviously stream of today is effectively, uh, I don't want to say rel next. It's more along the lines of rel x dot next. Uh, so if if it's rel eight or or whatever, it's it's rel eight dot whatever the next dot release is. It's it's I don't want to call it beta uh, because I was told not to. Um, but uh, you can draw your own conclusions from that comment. Uh, so recap: Fedora Community Space, Red Hat Private Space, CentOS Linux Partner Downstream Community Space. Um, that's kind of what it has been for a long time. So stream, we already talked a little bit about that, uh, but the, the industry changed uh, and, it, and it's been in a constant state of evolution. Things are trying to move faster. Uh, we've seen that from even things such as OpenStack and OpenShift where things are still in a six month, uh, at least for OpenShift, they're in a six month uh, release cadence. They're, they're moving continually fast and, and that's, that's the pace. Uh, the catch is you want to make sure you're doing right things correctly, or excuse me, you're doing correct things fast uh, as opposed to doing wrong things fast. Uh, so with this, the, the, ga the, the game plan was to find a way to get our enterprise interests 
and our enterprise partners that are actively developing uh, a faster method to get to market. Um, so basically what ended up happening was Red Hat approached the CentOS board and said, hey, our interest is in CentOS stream. And from an enterprise business decision perspective, we need to move our resources to better align with stream. And at the time, I believe that Red Hat only had a couple or three resources actually paying attention to the CentOS project as a whole, uh, you know, handling the build environment and things like that. And uh, one of them actually ended up leaving to go work at Microsoft. Uh, so, you know, that, that was kind of a interesting segue. It wasn't anything to do with this. It wasn't anything to do with, with uh, the, the way the conversation was going. He, you know, he found something there that, that he wanted to pay attention to and we wished him well and it was a mutual split. Um, the goal was actually from Red Hat, uh, not necessarily to end CentOS, the underlying Linux. Uh, it was more along the lines of, hey, our enterprise interests are moving over here. Um, what do you guys want to do? And that was a behind closed doors meeting. Uh, however, if you check the email list, it, it was, you know, it's obvious the, the number of Red Hat uh, voting members that we have on that board, and it's not uh, a uh, super majority or anything like that. And the vote was unanimous. Um, that's, you know, what came out of it. And it, it, my understanding, and don't hold me to this, but my understanding was that if the vote was not unanimous, uh, additional considerations were going to find a way to to be made. Um, hey, Rob. Yep. Real quick, um, we're, we're getting the uh, the broadcast in Brady Bunch mode, so if we can ask you to unshare, go back and reset the follow me, and then share again, I think that might resolve it. Yeah, I found that that sometimes is a little tricky. All right, you guys got me again? You're not coming up in uh, full screen yet. Try to share. I may have to unshare entirely. Yeah. There we go. And then go to the... How's that? Yep. Nope, still not working. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, you know, it's it's tricky because we had that problem uh, once before, and I forget the speaker. It wasn't on this meeting, uh, but uh, we played around with the uh, played around with the settings a little bit. So what worked for me was when Rob was sharing his slides. If I clicked on the Brady Bunch square that was the slides, that made it full screen. Right. Okay. That, that fixes it for everybody who's participating here. It just doesn't fix it for the YouTube stream. Yeah. Uh, right. But it is what it is, and we've only got 30 minutes with Rob, so let's. I, yeah. I'd say let's go ahead and continue. Okay. Okay. Yeah, right. Let's go ahead and continue. Am I still sharing my screen? No. No. How about now? Yeah, you're sharing the tiles. You're sharing. Well, there you go. Okay. All righty. So basically the, the gist of it is that CentOS Linux 6 ended uh, along with the life cycle of Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6. Uh, CentOS Linux 8 we are ending, uh, or the CentOS community rather, is ending on December 31st, 2021. Uh, CentOS Stream 8 uh, ends on May 31st, 2024. Um, which is based on the date in the rel life cycle. Uh, and then uh, CentOS Linux 7 doesn't change, and that stays with the life cycle of Red Hat Enterprise Linux uh, 7. And then CentOS Stream 9 will launch uh, Q2 along with the, uh, well, not along with, it'll launch a little ahead of Red Hat Enterprise Linux 9. 
So that's kind of the the gist of it. This is this is usually when I'm when I'm talking uh, my customers through this. This is usually when I start getting uh, questions and and things thrown at my head. Uh, any questions or things you guys would like to chime in and throw at my head? Well, I mean, um, uh, I assume this is probably get you get asked a lot about that, but like um, the the changing the end of life on on CentOS eight. Uh, how did that decision come about? Uh, I'll, I'll be totally honest with you. Um, we Red Hat didn't make that decision, so I would I would have to refer you to somebody on the uh, CentOS board for that date decision. Yeah, that's a question I'm getting at my organization because we just started going from seven to eight, and we built our dev server, our deployment server, around eight. And then I said, you know, we have, you know, this is where we stop. We might want to go back to seven. It's supported longer than eight. And that's when all the questions start to me, but it's good to have a place to ask that. Yeah. And, and one of the things that, that I want to make incredibly clear is that Red Hat went in and presented our business plans uh, in order to better support our paying customers and paying partners. And the CentOS board is is who made a lot of these decisions on dates and, and it, if i can be completely transparent um the the board actually wanted to make the announcement uh very quickly red hat wanted to delay the announcement ever so slightly so that we could actually get some of our developer programs a little bit better in place and better established like we're still coming out with the legal language to support the new developer offerings that that we are trying to provide to help fill these voids. And so it's it's one of those things where, and, and th don't take this as me trying to throw anybody under the bus, that's certainly not, not my intent here. Um, but the, the Red Hat Enterprise team is trying to help as much as we can, but in the same way that you know, if you ask somebody who's a chef how they can best help, the, the best way they can help is to cook or, or to make you some food. Uh, the best way that Red Hat is able to help is by contributing to the upstream community and continuing to help our, our enterprise customers with enterprise Linux. So, you know, it's, it's I, I don't want it to sound like a cop-out, but at the same time, the, uh, the CentOS board uh, is is largely who set these dates. The, also, the um, the <clears throat> it, it, so how come like CentOS Stream um, had to replace CentOS? Like, couldn't Stream have been like a separate uh, distro? So CentOS Stream is an, is a separate distribution, effectively. Uh, it is. It, share, it shares the same name and branding as CentOS. Uh, however, the Stream 8 is a completely different install with, yeah, it shares some of the same packages, but it is squarely upstream of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, where CentOS Linux was, uh, by and large, squarely downstream of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Yeah, but I'm saying, like, the... Um... Uh, they, they could be mutually exclusive, right? You could have... Uh you know, continue to have a CentOS type distribution and then also have the CentOS Steam distribution? Like when did it need to replace the other? I understand what you're saying. And the answer that I would say is that if the CentOS board had wanted to continue doing that, I don't think Red Hat would have done anything to stop it. I mean, it's the community. We couldn't have done anything to stop the board from finding a different enterprise sponsor to continue running the build system that Red Hat was effectively running for the CentOS community. Um, the, the, the challenge that the CentOS community had was that a, the group of individuals that had a vested interest in running CentOS for development purposes was largely targeted toward the upstream of Red Hat type of development. And so CentOS stream is the faster way to get packages into Red Hat Enterprise Linux for enterprise consumption. So the answer to your question is they could have, and that's what Rocky Linux seems to be targeting to continue with. 
Um, but uh, from a Red Hat business model and from an enterprise customer base standpoint, uh, our focus is on CentOS Stream. Hey, Rob. This is, this is Greg. Um, I, have a, I have a question for you. Sure. Um, and, and I'm coming at it from maybe a different perspective than I guess other people considering um, I'm one of the founders of CentOS. Why did Red Hat acquire CentOS? So first off, we didn't technically acquire CentOS because CentOS is a community. Uh, we became a corporate sponsor to the CentOS community and a partner of the CentOS community. Uh, we also offered up our legal services to protect the brand and trademarks and things that had been set forth. Uh, we did that to effectively set a development playground for our developers who needed something that was free to not run in production uh, to have access to Red Hat's bits. We decided to get closer to the uh, CentOS community uh, in order to help foster that sense of development and to continue working in, uh, in, in really whatever way we possibly could. Uh, we also knew that a lot of our paying customers were starting out on CentOS and then migrating to Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and we wanted to give them some semblance of, yes, you can do that. Yes, that is a, a feasible thing to do CentOS in development and then move into an Enterprise Linux for your production environments. Does that make sense? It, it does, um, but I, I also don't think it directly answers the question. So uh, I'll ask it um, maybe a yeah, little bit. Please, if I'm missing it, I, I want to answer the question. I'm not trying to be evasive. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, and I understand that. I'm not trying to put you in a weird position either. I'm just, I'm legitimately curious. Um, it definitely, you know, it was a community and, well, a very limited community. And I can go into reasons on why the culture of CentOS is, is the way it was and why it persisted that way, at least from my perspective. But um, there, there, and I agree it was not a traditional acquisition, but in the end, Red Hat ended up kind of controlling the project. And I'm using air quotes around controlling here. Because um, uh, while it, maybe it wasn't a super majority of the board, they definitely had a big, you know, kind of hand at the board. But more importantly than that, they control the domain. They Red Hat owns the trademark, which is very weird considering that name came through me originally. So I'm kind of curious how Red Hat got a trademark on something that has, you know, a, a 10 year previous legacy on, you know, an, an open community. But things like that, it just it just seems weird. And then to change it, right, Centos. Uh, the name, I mean, it's even community enterprise. Well, I don't think the community was very well represented in terms of the decision as as um, can be seen by the amount of influx of people that came to, to Rocky. And it doesn't seem like an enterprise. And I, tr I appreciate your point on beta, uh, it not being a beta, but it is kind of a beta. So it's not really, the, the cent in the incentos is, it doesn't really mean it anymore. So I'm just kind of curious, why did Red Hat want to acquire it? if the goal was to remove it or change it, or if that's the end result. So any information you can provide there, I think would be great. Yeah, and, and I, I, I think that part of the challenge, when I look at it and when I look at some of my customers, the, the question that I ask them is, if this was so imperative to your enterprise, why weren't you on the board? Why weren't you advocating? And, and you know, that's kind of a, a backward thing to, to say, and, and people sometimes have taken it as a slap in the face. But the reality is that when I looked at the CentOS board and who was coming up for elections, and I counted, I think it was technically four of 11 were Red Hat Associates. Uh, Two others technically did have direct Red Hat ties, but did not work. For, they weren't on Red Hat payroll. And the only veto power that we had, uh, to the best of my knowledge, is if something was going to directly impact the build system that we managed, we had the ability to say no. So if somebody wanted to do uh, some type of massive rebuild or inject a package or, or change the way that we were building things, we could, we could effectively say no. Um, what I see when I look at that community is, yeah, it's, it's a lot of Red Hat influence. It's a lot of Red Hat uh, kind of corporate uh, 
I don't want to say pushing a pushing around because I don't think that pushing the CentOS community around is was our was our goal or or was ever something that that we intended to do. Um, probably the biggest question that I get asked is why did Red Hat leave all of the developers out to dry? And that's kind of the the next section that that we probably will only get to dust over here on on this slide deck, but is the the concept of of Red Hat developer um, and what we're doing with the development offerings to try to help people uh, with zero cost development on actual Red Hat Enterprise Linux as opposed to starting in one place and having to migrate over. Uh, as far as you know, your question specifically about why did Red Hat acquire the community? I, I still I'll still challenge the the term acquisition. Uh, I would prefer the and and I I don't think there's you know I think there's clarity on on the the concept of establishing as a partner to the community or even a corporate uh, backing or an enterprise uh, enterprise backing to the community uh, for our business interests, which was at the time the active development. Uh, ultimately, we didn't have a plan. I don't think to change it. Uh, otherwise, uh, if I'm if I'm completely transparent again, if we intended to change the community, I don't think we would have waited a full six years to do it. Um, so, or or however long that's been. Um, so I, I I don't have a lot of answers to your question, um, but that's hopefully at, at least in some way a, a bit of an explanation, at least from the Rob Wilmoth perspective of what's going on. So I think. I think that's a that's a fair response. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut anyone off, but just to kind of uh, finish with that um, that comment line, which I think is really good. Thank your you. Your audio is fading a little bit. Yeah. Oh. Thank you, guys. Um, yeah, I was going to try to get Brian Exelbeard Bex on there, who is on the uh, CentOS board, and uh, he's got the invite. He said he'd come, and then. He realized it was 7 p.m. Eastern. He lives in Czech, Czech Republic, so he was unable to make the time to do it because it's 1 o'clock a.m. his time. So unfortunately, I wasn't able to get a board member here. So this is Lee. I have a quick question. Is it is it Red Hat's position that um, I th I'm going to have to paraphrase here and let me know if I get it wrong or misunderstand what you were saying, Rod, but it sounded like you said if the community didn't like that, they should have sought more representation on the board. Is that really Red Hat's Red Hat's position? No, that's that's what Rob Wilmoth said. Um, so basically, the the board was made up of individuals who represented organizations that were actively leveraging uh, CentOS for development use cases that they wanted to get certain things back into Red Hat Enterprise Linux um, or, or they wanted to push forward the operating system. And the only way to push forward the operating system from CentOS Linux is to get something either, a, a, if it's a bug, you can probably file that within a bugzilla and it'll get picked up in a future version of Enterprise Linux. Uh, but if it's a feature or hardware enablement or something along those lines, it has to pretty much go almost all the way, if not all the way back to Fedora in order to get that included. Sure. So we needed a way to shortcut that process with CentOS. Okay. When you look at the board and you look at the individual members and the, the organizations that they represent, they're... To my knowledge, and again, this is this is me, this isn't Brian, this isn't somebody on the board, there wasn't a representation from any particular organization that I was familiar with that was leveraging CentOS Linux as a production operating system for their organization. It was it was I would venture to say all development type use cases that had a vested interest in pushing forward the operating system or pushing forward various pieces of the operating system in order to accelerate what they were able to and capable of doing. And sure. doing that in Fedora, obviously Fedora is the, the speeding bullet. You can't jump on it or, or you're you know, going to potentially get hurt. And then even if you do jump on the speeding bullet, 
at best, you're looking at uh, 12 to 18 months to get something included. Uh, worst case, you're looking at three to six years to get something included in RHEL uh, versus stream, which gives you potentially a six to 12 month path, depending on what you're working on. Okay, thanks for the info. Yes, sir. So are you saying that the the board was is predominantly consistent, and I apologize, I'm trying to, to understand, that the board was predominantly really developer focused and less enterprise organization focused. I mean, that's what I'm hearing. That is correct. That's my understanding as well. So that seems that seems very odd considering, you know, the amount of enterprises that are that are using it. I mean, uh, there's a massive number of enterprises using it. Uh, it seems odd that it was just that the board was comprised from a development perspective as opposed to uh, enterprises that are using it. I could not agree more. Yeah. And and frankly, some of those uh, massive enterprises that are using it are my customers. And I, I've had the, the hard conversation of, did you think about having one of your team members run for or put their name in the hat to be on the board? Did you think about you know, doing some of these things. And, and it's, it's again, it's not me trying to slap somebody in the face and say, well, if you had really considered this serious, you would have done blah, 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 because, you know, I'm, I'm married and that doesn't work with my wife. So it doesn't, it's not going to work with a customer. Uh, but uh, the, the, the basis of the feedback that I've been getting was, well, we thought somebody else would do it. And, and literally one of the largest telecommunications companies in this country, the lead of their infrastructure operations said those words to me. So that's a really that's a really interesting point, Rob. Which is, you know, and I know you have to go here soon, but I wish we had the full time with you because I'd love to to chat more with you about this and and to hear your responses on some of this. But the the, the CentOS culture right from the beginning was always very small and and um, uh, core only because of it, that's how we initially had to deal with the, the signing keys, right? You, mm -hmm. you, you couldn't open that up, right? You had very tight control of that. So even though people came and asked to be part of the project, we never could let anybody else be part of the project. It always had to stay very core. And that created a culture in CentOS that I think, um, honestly, I think kind of may have led to uh, to that perspective that, you know, this is, this is, it's a small group, somebody else is running it. I don't really have the means to, to engage with that. So maybe to some extent, you know, the C and the CentOS was, was never really um, truly community-based right from the beginning. Um, but with that being said, uh, yeah, I mean, I, not to talk about Rocky at this point, but that being said, that's one of the things that we're absolutely trying to fix all the way down to the culture on day one. Yeah, and, and if I can comment on on that point, you know, one of the things that I've found from my specifically, you know, my colleagues, my friends, my customers, uh, even even Red Hat Associates, just because Red Hat has gotten well, hell, when I started, it was eleven hundred people, and now I think the the Red Hat portion of it is, you know, well, pre acquisition was was thirteen five or something like that. Uh, so I mean, it, it's it's changed the culture for Red Hat. Uh, just because of the the growth and popularity of of open source as a whole, um, so you know if 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 I can make the comment that I would say giving people easier avenues to number one get involved, but also number two see that their contributions are recognized and are being leveraged is a really big thing. So even if you don't have somebody with signing keys or on the board. If they're managing a special interest group, if they are contributing to documentation, if they are on the mailing list answering questions or answering questions in the forum, you know, I, I uh, the the one organization that I mentioned before I went to to talk to this uh, senior director, I did my homework. I, I checked to see if any of his uh, associates were on any of the CentOS mailing list. You know, I didn't want to give anybody a black eye uh, uh, unjustly or anything like that, but. The, the reality was that the amount of consumers that you had of the CentOS community uh, or of the CentOS Linux community compared to the people who, for whatever reason, were contributing back, uh, with open source, you have to have that, 
that cycle of contribution, you know, with, with a, a, a customer uh, vendor Red Hat relationship, you have that via dollars that go back to Red Hat and then we do that on their behalf. You guys all know that. Uh, some of you on the call have done that on behalf of our customers before in a roundabout way. But I, I think for Rocky to succeed, uh, it has to have that, that circuitous motion uh, much more than CentOS Linux did, if, if that makes sense. And it sounds like you, you're trying to build that from day one, which is, is awesome. And, and if the community is successful, that's perfect. That's exactly what you want to see. Yeah, you just you just nailed on a, a huge piece of what we're trying to do. I mean, uh, you know, we could have started on day one, really focused on just you know rebuilding RHEL, creating the operating system, but instead we focused on the the infrastructure. Sorry about the puppy. Uh, we focused on the infrastructure, um, trying to give everyone a mechanism so they can contribute and feel like they're part of this open community, um, as opposed to immediately just replicating what you know we we did with CentOS. Yeah, I, I think that you know this is an opportunity to learn not only on the uh, on on your team for for how to do it, but I will be shocked if the outpouring of support doesn't stick around in a more meaningful way, especially from other enterprise organizations that that have been shocked by this. That being said, I think that the people who truly just want a development or an HPC or, or some type of repeatable platform, and they were truly only using CentOS, not for the purpose of contributing back, but just for the purpose of consuming. Uh, I do think that in a lot of use cases, those organizations will find uh, a home within the Red Hat developer model, especially the ones that were literally only using it as a stopgap to get over the hump and they had no intent in, in contributing back. Um, you know, it, it's, it's going to be, that's, I think, going to be one of your challenges. Of course, you want to welcome all, but at the same time, if, if only, you know, one or two people are doing all of the work, it, it kind of doesn't help with the open source and the community model that, uh, that needs to be there. Yeah, that's, that, yeah, that rings true home, uh, very, very much. Uh, the one thing I, I push back a little bit on is I think you're right about the developers. I think they're going to want something that's more, a little bit more current, more up to date. And I think I think we see a lot of the developer resources and contingents really focused on Fedora as a result of that. Mm -hmm. um, but the HPC community, um, you know, I spent 20 years working for Department of Energy, specifically building out, you know, HPC systems and you know some of the the biggest systems in the world and helping to architect those. Um, yeah, some of those are still running RHEL 6. Uh, they won't change. They're not going to update. They, they want stable. They don't ever want to have to touch their 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 runtime or their kernel. Uh, so they need that stability. Uh, and that's a big contingent of why I'm doing this is actually for those HPC use cases. Yeah, and and forgive me. So there, there's there's that type of HP use case. And then because I'm telco, I'm also in, in the media space where transcoding, rendering, you know, movies, uh, animation, stuff like that. They need the latest and greatest so that they can have the latest and greatest hardware uh, because they are trying to push the absolute envelope with like the, the newest, latest, greatest unreleased NVIDIA GPU uh, just to try to get under the four year mark to make an animated film. So I, I think there's, there's going to be different types of those use cases coming forward. And uh, you're right. Uh, I, I actually did uh, energy and utilities of all things. I spent entirely too much of my life at Duke Energy uh, in Charlotte. But uh, basically- oh, you're, from, you're from Duke? Sorry to interrupt, you're from Duke? Uh, no, 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 no. Oh. Uh, I was at Red Hat covering energy and utilities. So I built Red Hat's energy and utilities vertical, essentially. Got um, it, got it. I, I know, so, so you probably know the legacy of Seth Vidal and whatnot from Duke. Uh, yep. so I've always worked closely with with them and specifically Seth in the early days, but that's what that's what made me think of that. Sorry about that. Yeah. For everyone else, Seth Vidal is the author of Yum, so <laughs> pretty well known. Was oh, the yeah. author, I would say. He he passed away unfortunately. All right, so I am at uh, about five minutes over. Any last minute questions? I'm I'm sorry that I wasn't able to spend more time with you, but if if you'll have me back, I'm I'm happy to join again. Yeah, Rob, can you send us a copy of your slides so we can post them on the blue server? Yep. I can do that. Okay, thanks. And who was that talking? Who do I need to send them to? Uh, John, me, Rob, this is Christoph. I'll forward it to Jabber. 
Okay, uh, Christoph, you probably have access to these, but I'll uh, I'll shoot you a link. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Rob. Yeah. Thank you for answering. Maybe, what we can do is uh, we really can do it. Um, next month. Uh, you know, uh, I'm scheduled to cover some topics, so uh, maybe Rob, you can give you another half hour at the front end to cover the developer subscriptions. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Sure, that'd be great. Yeah, I just want to mention that uh, we've got uh, the Rocky Linux people here today. Uh, uh, Brian Clemens is here. And, hey, how's uh, it going? Greg Kurtzner and uh, Lee Henning. Lee Henning. Yep. I used to work with a Hugh Henning. Oh, was he a nice guy? Did he represent uh, me well? <laughs> well, we weren't really close friends at work. <laughs> he was restaurant. Uh, and I was programming. So we were yeah, it's a politically common, different. Uh, yeah, common enough last name in Germany. Yep. <laughs> Jerry, I just wanted to throw out a question because I, I don't want to I don't want to drag Rob into it because I know he had to take off, but um, one issue I've kind of seen in the last year, um, and, and I felt like CentOS to some degree with because they're in relation to Red Hat and IBM, like I, I've seen sort of cordoning off of open source software by companies that were trying to monetize it. Um, like I, I used to work for Chef, um, and I know that they, they kind of threw out their software to drive up adoption in hopes of bringing revenue um, for paid services. But it seems like when they didn't reach their targets, they, you know, they turned around and then started to tighten their licenses and say, you can only use our software if you give us money uh, or agree to this, the, you know, the license for very restricted uh, types of usage. And um, I've seen other companies, I think Varios, which is a bacula fork, um, you know, they, they used to be open source, but then I think when they didn't get, they didn't get enough money for paid services, they started to tighten um, areas of, of where you could use their software. Um, and, and I guess I was worried that, that CentOS, um, you know, uh, going to stream and, and, and maybe kind of drive up adoption for RHEL. I mean, I, I don't know if that was the case or not. I, I can't say, but like, it just seems like a lot of open source um, is, is starting to get closed off. I don't know if, if anyone else kind of agreed with that yeah, or. I'll answer that a little bit to the best of them. So this is Christoph um, and I do work for Red Hat. I'm not part of any of those conversations, but I can give you my perspective as an employee. Um, I, I, I don't see that being the case, uh, primarily because IBM's always been a great contributor, even before Red Hat acquisition, IBM has been a great contributor, both monetarily and through, uh, you know, development contributions upstream. Um, but, uh, I, th from what I've heard, Paul Wave talk, I believe this decision to introduce streams was actually arrived at before the I, the IBM acquisition was announced. I'm not, you know, don't quote me on that, but that's what I've heard. So well, I, I don't feel like the, it's related to any of this. Yeah. And I also, I want to, I want to, um, I want to preface to that, you know, like I, I, I want Red Hat to succeed and get money because I like having people maintain things like system D and pulse audio, um, you know, and I, I believe people that, that do that work, it's hard work and they should definitely get compensated for it. But like, um, you know, I remember back in the day, like say there'd be like foundations that would get donations and fund developers. Um, whereas now you have more privatized companies that, you know, try to drive in revenue to, to pay for developers. Um, and in some cases it works, in some cases it doesn't. I know like Mozilla had a round of layoffs recently. I mean, for, from a way that Red Hat does business, nothing's changed, right? We we have our enterprise products that derive from community source code, and then our enterprise bits, the source for that is published and available. So none, that hasn't changed. The only perspective that I think that's changing here is 
this CentOS project is kind of shifting where it fits in the Fedora, Red Hat, CentOS puzzle, right? And where in the release cycle it sits. Christoph, is that is that equally true for like OpenShift? As far as I know, uh, can you provide, provide a little bit more context? Yeah, so, and first thing I'm gonna mention is I'm like, you know, since the uh, mid-ish, early-ish 90s, I've been an open source advocate, uh, huge into open source, and I've seen exactly the, the the transition or the switch that Chris is referring to, or at least I agree with him there, a, a hundred, maybe even a thousand percent. Um, and and I do, so I don't fault, so the first thing I'm gonna prefix is I don't fault Red Hat at all for this, but Red Hat has a whole commercial line of, of, of a product, which is OpenShift, right? That's not an, it's based on something that comes out of open source, but it is it is by all practical means. I mean, it is, it is commercial and that source code is not released, right? So I'm just kind of curious. Um, I, believe, I believe everything in OpenShift is released. Is it not? Is it what is it? The OKD project? Let me look. If it is, I'd be happy to be wrong on that. Yeah. If I remember OKD correctly, they release it uh, twelve or eighteen months after it's uh, the 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 open source release is obsolete, and the uh, current version is proprietary. Ah, okay. The, yeah, the, see, it was like that for a long time. And I, I remember when OpenShift 4 came out and then like they were like up, you know, upping the minor versions, OKD was left out just in the cold, like period. And it was just like, there was no reason for that. Um, so OpenShift 4 marked a transition from the use of RHEL as the foundation to CoreOS. Um, I don't, I don't know if that's related, but that, that could probably be why the open source community needs some extra time to kind of get those bits that worked around. I'm, I'm not sure, but that's. So, so one, one thing I, I just want to just go back to what, what Chris mentioned, because I didn't mean to make this, um, a negative towards Red Hat at all. Right. Uh, but, uh, that, that transition, Chris, that I think you're referring to. And if it yeah, is, it, was, it wasn't, it wasn't a CentOS specific argument. I think it was uh, just a broader open source argument. Yeah. And I've absolutely seen it. I mean, let me give an example. When, when Rocky started, I mean, we, we, we were on Slack, right? How many open source projects are currently on Slack, right? You go back 10 years ago, 15 years ago, there's no way in heck that would have been tolerated, uh, for an open source project to be leveraging a commercial a proprietary solution there. I mean, we've definitely, to Chris's point, we've definitely seen transition towards the, the, the commercial sector and a little bit less on the open source side. So I think that that's definitely a trend that we're seeing. I agree with you, Chris. Yeah, I think another example is is Elastic, which, which I have mixed feelings for, because on one hand, um, I, I agree with them tightening the restrictions about how their software is used by cloud providers. Um, and you consider how much Amazon has made off of hosting Elastic, but at the same time, um, you know the whole uh, the, their whole XPack paywall has made my ability to manage Elastic harder. Um, so th there's another side of this as well, though. So I I'm coming at this from the startup CEO, you know, side. Um, I've now I'm on my second company. I exited my first, and uh, in the first. Uh, we actually had all of our, well, the primary kind of piece of our of our whole core technology was open source. I can't tell you the number of, of people, other vendors, organizations, and whatnot that, um, to be blunt, n never bought anything, right? They, you know, we, we had uh, probably about a 90% market share of container, uh, as the, of the container runtime within high performance computing environments. Um, Yet very few of them ever actually, you know, bought support or bought a license or bought help, and that absolutely affects the ability to 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 pay for the to pay for the company to pay for the development, uh, and that is that is something that needs to be considered. So as, as I'm approaching this problem again, I have to say I am considering alternatives to a complete open source of our of our you know one piece of our platform, uh, and. There's just there, we, we've got to figure out a way of just you know um, somehow getting people to do the right thing, which is to to buy support, to buy licenses. I, I was thinking about you know what about if if 
comp or you know if if open source developers went back to the foundation model where we're like okay we're going to give this software you know as open source but you know we need money to fund our operations not necessarily you know to have some sort of you know contractual obligation to provide support but um <laughs> Just to say, hey, if you like our stuff, um, please, you know, donate to our foundation, or it won't be there anymore. You'd think in a in a world where Patreon is funding so much nowadays that that would that, that would definitely be possible. Maybe it is. I don't know. I haven't I haven't seen it personally, but maybe there is something there. We we won't uh, collect funding for the product itself. We'll collect funding for all of us sitting together and talking about it, and that'll pay for it. <laughs> This is something, uh, Neil uh, Hanlon, I live in Cambridge, uh, work for kayak.com, um, and I work, do some of the infrastructure stuff for Rocky as well. Um, it's something like getting the ability to support open source projects that are leveraged by companies, and um, you know, my the company I work for in particular is something that I've uh, fought with with our management and continue to, to this day because it is... <laughs> It, it, it is very much this thing of what is right morally to do is never going to be the right thing for the business to do. Like uh, in a capitalistic world, the businesses, especially public traded businesses are, are the goal is to produce revenue revenue for the shareholders and giving it away to a product that is free either for support or for a foundation is just the wall that I continue hitting. And if anyone has gone past this, I'd, I'd love tips on it, but the wall that I continually hit is, is kind of, you know, how do I, how, how do you get companies to see that look forward and see that if you don't support this, it will go away because there's uh, it's hard to get people to see that when the difference is giving away a lot of money for something that they can get for free. I would just add that it's not just publicly traded companies that have a fiduciary responsibility that is legally um, right. <laughs> set forth, right? Um, the moment I have a shareholder or an employee, even if I have you know a small company, a small startup, I've got exactly that same fiscal responsibility um, that is, you know, I, I'm legally justified to to ensure, right? It's hard to say, I'm going to go spend a bunch of money on something that I'm currently getting for free and I don't need any help on. Are there any parallels we can draw from the early days of OpenStack? Because I think uh, there we saw every top organization trying to implement OpenStack on their own with the do-it-yourself model. And I think it was a very difficult 10 years. <laughs> We as open source developers have to make all of our software so complicated that nobody can do it unless they pay us. <laughs> That's the model. <laughs> um, just, uh, I think on February 1st, uh, Cloudera walled off their Yum repos. Um, you know, and I think we were, we were getting some, um, some Zookeeper stuff from the repos and it just stopped working one day. Uh, you know, then I went to their website and saw they, you know, basically they've adopted the Goodfellas um, financial model uh, for getting access to their repos um, that they, they want paid subscribers, uh, I, I guess now, if, if you're going to access the repos, probably to offset the hosting costs. But I mean, I agree with them that, you know, hosting isn't free. Um, and that the money's got to come from somewhere, but you know it, it's disruptive um, when they just make these decisions out of the blue. So, I don't know. Is is it okay if I, 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 I segue into into um, what we've been working on with Rocky since we got a bunch of Rocky people here? Oh yeah, sorry. Because I think it's a perfect. Well, I think it, I think it's a perfect opening because, um, you know, within and so maybe maybe I can talk a little bit about the growth because I think it's really important. Um, within a month of that announcement um, of what Rob was talking about, you know, our Slack boomed to about ten thousand plus people to the point where we couldn't keep up with it. We moved over to Mattermost to to try to get ahead of it. 
um, because Slack, the free Slack is just, it's very, <laughs> it's very limiting. And with 10,000 people, 10,000 message limit does not last long. Right. So um, that was really a, a point to, to all the people that want to be part of a, of a, of a community and want to help and see something grow. And from that perspective, right, we, we, we kind of, we, we have an obligation to make sure that what we're creating is 100% by and for the community. So um, I'm, I'm basically sitting in this organization wearing two hats. The hat of my, my company that I'm funded for um, by both VC investors and, and employees. And on the other side, a organization focused for the community. And the reason why I can balance this so well is because this company over here needs this community. And I've met so many other people from many communities, uh, you know, everywhere, all, all different sizes as well, that need exactly the same thing. And it came into this, th this idea came into us from, from the perspective of we're, we're not just an open source community. We're actually an open source community of not only individuals, but also enterprises, large enterprises that all want to be part of this. So we have people that are interested, but we also have enterprises. And, and that is something that's kind of different, right? <laughs> At least in my experience in open source. Uh, so as I describe this and I think about this, this is really an, an enterprise, excuse me, an open source that's really by and for enterprise organizations. And so we're kind of representing a different, an entirely different perspective. Um, and I think that that's, uh, that's a really important perspective to be thinking about because now all of a sudden we actually have competing organizations, organizations that are competitors to each other that are working together to help this project. There's something kind of massive there, right? And, and it's not because that even people that are trying to make money on this project, right? People that are basically building products, building platforms, building services, these organizations are all coming together to help Rocky right now. And that's what we're doing. We've actually, uh, it, it's a funny story. We actually first said, you know, we got Rocky Linux and we have people offering us money. So we have to set up a foundation such that we can, we can create a bank account and accept this money. So we, we just quickly called it the Rocky Linux foundation. Didn't realize that we completely just stepped on top of the Linux foundation trademark and 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 what they're set out to do so uh you know we we had some conversations with them and you know we decided you know and, and they're they're awesome by the way <laughs> it was not an aggressive conversation at all uh, but we decided it does make sense for us to change the name and we've really thought like what is it we're here to do and it's much more so than just creating an, an operating system it's creating an entire community really built for um and by enterprise organizations and enterprise organizations did not necessarily mean commercial, right? This could be academia, this could be government, but really that enterprise kind of focus. And that's what we came together to do. Um, so we, we did rename ourselves, um, at least the, the foundation, right? It's still Rocky Linux as our product uh, and, or a project, I should say. But from the foundation side, it's the Rocky Enterprise Software Foundation. And that's how we see what we're bringing to the community and what it is that we're here to do. And um, yeah, it's been, it's been an amazing ride so far and it's been a pleasure to work with everybody that we've had and, and all of the corporate sponsors and people that are being part of this. But um, yeah, that's something I really wanted to, to bring up with this regard because it seems very, um, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> very much in alignment with, with the points that Chris was bringing up. So just, Curiosity, what's different in how you manage, let's say, uh, a, a patch request? How is that handled differently in Rocky than it may have been handled before in CentOS? Oh, I'm not sure it even would be handled differently, right? Um, for the most part, you know, the goal is to be bug for bug compatible with our with the upstream source. So, um, you know, what we probably do is is check to see if that bug exists in RHEL, and if it does. You know, we would we would either ask the user to submit the bug to RHEL directly, or maybe at some point we can have a good relationship with Red Hat. So we would uh, we can actually work with the Red Hat developers and maybe get access to your your Bugzilla and be able to submit that bug on behalf of our user base. And what we're doing in that case is we're actually helping to at least I think 
we're helping to make Red Hat Enterprise Linux a better product um, by doing that. Would, uh, so my reason I bring that up is wouldn't the new scenario be you'd go patch it in CentOS stream so that it trickles into RHEL. So there's, there's now a more legit way of submitting a patch and getting it into RHEL quicker. That's so from my understanding, that's the whole purpose behind stream. So um, there's an, there's an option there, but we, we may patch it. We may put it into stream and we definitely may help with that. Absolutely. But we would not implement it in, in Rocky until after RHEL implements it in RHEL because we don't right. want to fork that package. But you're exactly right. I mean, there's, there's a tremendous opportunity there as well. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. That's a good point. Yeah, this, this is Lee. I, I think just to add to that, I don't think that from a, a Rocky perspective, um, you know, we think that, um, you know, what, what Sunstream is, is intended to do um, is like anything that's, that's bad. I, I think our perspective is more um, along the lines of, you know, we have a fairly large user base that wants to to go in a different direction that doesn't necessarily mean anything you know derogatory or like we don't take an adversarial approach to what red hat and scent and scent stream are doing i think there's a lot of opportunity to work together um, we just have a different kind of use case for our user base that we would um, want to ensure that we can support well i think also that that kind of gives a good line of demarcation between enterprise and development like, well, that development use case of addressing a bug sounds like, yeah, it's definitely geared towards um, the stream, but, you know, you want those fixes to be disseminated in a way to keep the enterprise operating system stable, you know, which is why it was called CentOS and not CDevOS. <laughs> Uh, I was going to say it had a point here, but you just made me laugh, so I actually forgot it. <laughs> so you're going to go back in time and have uh, Rocky 6, 7, and 8? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. There's a great um, market for six right now. I could use some 5.4 if you've got it. <laughs> 2, 2.1. <laughs> um, it's a great question. I mean, you know, we, we, this is the first time we've actually, that I've heard a request for six um, or five. Um, but with that being said, I mean, if there's enough need, I, I would think yes. But it really, it's going to come around to need. And, and do we have organizations that really want to, to sponsor that um, in the form of development effort? Um, if, if Red Hat were to, or rather CentOS were to do the same thing with CentOS 7, let's say for example, CentOS 7 EOL, EOLs early. Um, I, I do think depending on how early that is and what the transition period would be, uh, we may actually, yeah, we may see a, a situation where we'd have to, um, you know, kind of finish, you know, or offer an update stream or something to 7. I really hope that isn't the case, um, uh, you know. To, to be blunt, uh, the implementation of what Red Hat and CentOS wants to do here isn't the problem. Um, the problem really had to do with the messaging, in my mind. If, if Red Hat would have gone out, and I know we can always do the, the what ifs, you know, ands or buts and all of that sort of stuff, but if Red Hat would have gone out and say, look, we're planning on doing this and we want to enable the next rebuild or the next CentOS or somebody can somebody take over CentOS as we're making beta OS, sorry. <laughs> right? Whatever that may be. I mean, if they would have been upfront about that and say, here's where this is going. And we know that there's still a need for CentOS, but maybe it doesn't exist in Red Hat, right? Maybe if somebody else wants to pick it up, go for it. We'll help you. Um, but that isn't what happened. What happened was it was like, boom, there's, there's a line, right? And all of a sudden, everybody's kind of out of luck. And this isn't the first time that Red Hat has done this. The first time Red Hat did this, CentOS was born. Right, so going back in time as we're talking about rebuilds, right? When anybody remember Red Hat Linux before Enterprise Linux? Yeah, I bought I bought them at CompUSA. Yeah, 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 and then, but you didn't have to buy them, right? You could just download them because it was free. Yeah. And um, Red Hat Linux, and uh, you know, I have to go way back in my memory. Uh, 
it was what they they released they had 7.3 7 7.4 which was fantastic 8 came out yeah. and then 9 came out and then it was like within like a couple months boom it was done and they didn't just end 9 they ended everything overnight and then all of a sudden they had this new shiny project or product called Red Hat Enterprise Linux and said any everybody that whole community of users we've got your solution for you just give us your credit card and all of a sudden CentOS was born. So this isn't the first time that something like this has happened. And by doing this, it actually, it, it kind of alienated a lot of what Chris was talking about earlier with this trend towards open source, uh, excuse me, this trend towards commercialization of open source. Uh, one, uh, one, use, uh, one of the use cases for the older version is the digital preservation. I mean, sometimes people want to run old software and, uh, when technology's moved on, it can be impossible if you don't have the old machines or you don't the VMs. Uh. Yeah, so containers, containers and VMs are helping a lot with that now. We had one use case at Berkeley Lab where there was a research system um, underneath the desk um, of somebody's, you know, that, that was off in the corner. It was a computer that a postdoc wrote some code on like 17 years ago. And uh, that system was completely forgotten, but that software was in the pipeline via shared file system and SSHing and whatnot in terms of these scripts that these scientists were using. And it was absolutely a required piece of this, this pipeline and everybody has forgotten about it. It ran underneath someone's desk and it lasted like ridiculously long. I don't remember what the vendor was, but you know, kudos to them. Um, and then it died all of a sudden and they needed access to the, to the code. They needed to get the pipeline working we containerized it into Singularity, into a Singularity container. And then we installed that, that container, just copied that container over to our big HPC system that was running at the time, you know, um, what was it, CentOS 7.1, I think. And the container ran fine, as long as you didn't do a PS because proc, mapped, uh, prop map, proc mappings have changed since back then. But as long as you didn't do a PS or a top, code actually worked. <laughs> So great way of completely uh, destroying, you know, and, and, and getting bit rot, but it worked. Well, to, to the question, though, I think it's really important, right? So the original question that I remember was, do you plan on doing something like, you know, Ascent 567, whatever like that? One of the things that we're really trying to do is enable the community. So my default position is, you know, if... If somebody asks a question, can you or will you do this, um, I like to try and think about um, how that can happen, right? So we had somebody who came on our forums who asked whether or not we were going to publish a route. Last time, I think this came up with sent, the, the um, part of the concern was there was no way to really validate CVE closure. So the response was that we gave was, you know, we don't have a team dedicated to validating that closure, but if you want to do it, and um, because this is something we're really trying to support the community, and if you want to gather like a group of people who are interested in working on this, then we'll do whatever it is that we can to support you to enable that. So um, that is the position that we'd like to take. Whatever the community wants, um, if that's if you guys can rally somebody behind it, um, then that's what we will try to do. So if there's demand for um, older versions, uh, Rocky being ported to say, 6 or whatever, um, then, yeah, if you want to gather around people to do it and that's something that we can help you do and help support, um, then, then I, I could see that happening. It really is community-driven. So if, if, you know, whatever we can do, I think, to, to enable that. Um, is something that we would try. So, you know, that said, right now, I haven't seen a whole lot of um, requests for that come in. I haven't really seen a whole bunch of users rally around wanting to make that happen. Um, you know, but we have uh, plans for a whole bunch of different special interest groups to enable different community requests um, for extensions to, you know, security related things or HPC related things or pretty much whatever you know, the, the community wants, um, that's what we'll try to do. Well, we'll talk about digital preservation. It's not generally going to be things people are requesting now, but 
things uh, like someone might want to do five years from now or maybe even 50 years from now? Um, yeah, I, I, I think my, I, I don't anticipate my answer would change. Sorry, John, I missed your question. Were you asking about a 50 year life cycle for the next version of Rocky? <laughs> no, I, I, was, I was trying to, uh, to, to like maintaining older versions of the OS, uh, in a way that said people uh, in the distant future would still be able to run old software if they had a need for it. So it's kind of like the CentOS vault, but like a Rocky vault instead. So it would probably make more sense to make sure the old CentOS build could continue to run. I, yeah, I'm a, I'm a big advocate of compatibility. Um, and I actually recently read uh, what I thought was an excellent article on Medium by Steve, I'm going to uh, massacre the pronunciation of his last name, by Steve Yegi over at Google. The title of the article is, Dear Google Cloud, Your Deprecation Policy is Killing You. Um, I agree with him a thousand percent on this. Um, he was somebody that was at Google for a while. He's currently at Amazon. That was published August of last year. Um, I don't mind dropping that in the chat here if you guys want to check it out. But I, my personal views align with that pretty strongly, and I suspect many people here as well. John, there's another side I think of what what you know you're asking too. Um, FDA, for example, and, and FAA in aerospace have certain requirements of compliance of whenever software is being used in either a clinical or a trial type run. Um, and to, to ensure that that is um, completely reproducible, they consider that software stack a medical device. And in doing so, that medical device, and then they have, then, then that software now has to comply with the regulations of a medical device. And the medical device says that whenever you are, and, and please forgive me if I totally misquote this, but the gist of it is that whenever you're using a medical de device in, in clinical or trials or whatever, you need to be able to replicate a particular outcome, both for uh, medical reasons as well as, as you can assume, for legal reasons. <laughs> so, you need to be able to take that medical device in a matter of speaking and basically put that up on the shelf and know you can come back to that 10, 20, maybe even 30 years later. Now, if software has the same requirements, we start have to, we have to start thinking of software differently. Um, the idea and notion of containers has somewhat changed this um, in the sense that we can, you know, we can we can pull up a container and I, I gave a demonstration of a container that was over 15 years old running um, native speed, uh, you know, without any emulation, and it can work. Uh, but at some point, I think we're going to end up having to emulate um, that that operating system. But luckily, I just saw some um, old like Atari simulators and um, a King's Quest simulator to actually runs in the browser. So pretty soon, in, in 20 years, we might be able to replicate a whole supercomputer inside of our browsers on our phones. Uh, so maybe we won't be too too bad out of luck <laughs> and just run that old image. So I'm going to drop. Um, I'll put my email in the chat. Um, I really appreciate the, the time to chat with everybody here. And if there's any questions or anything I can do or help or answer or just, you know, chat, you know, talk about the weather in Maine or Boston, um, then I'm happy to do so. But thank you very much for um, for having me on. I really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you, Lee. Yeah, thanks, Lee. I guess digital preservation is a whole separate issue that we can talk to uh, talk about for hours that really has nothing to do with the current uh, with tonight's current topic, <laughs> or it's more of a tangent. Uh, so. so I've I've talked a lot already in in this, and I, I we have a bunch of people here from the Rocky team. So, um, if, are there any questions that we can answer? And and I'm sure we have multiple team leads here that can definitely you know field lots of different types of questions. Uh, than anybody may have. Um, otherwise, I'm happy to keep talking because I, I can talk for hours straight, as my wife will will attest to, um, and bore the heck out of everybody. But <laughs> I've, I've got a question um, that that may or may not be answerable because it's kind of a question I'm coming up with as I'm talking. But um, 
we run a lot of CentOS 7, 8, and I know that I, I have seen people come up with scripts to, let's say, do an upgrade from a running system, essentially, an established system, to a whole new build of Linux. Is that a thing you guys are are talking about releasing for some of your, what we are as a very small customer or smallish customer? Is that a thing that you guys are considering? And is that even a, a smart right. idea? That kind yes. of spell idea just, that scares Just to clarify, do you mean from seven to eight? No, from, from CentOS 7 to Rocky Linux 7, or I'm sorry, from CentOS 8 to Rocky Linux 8, let's say we're, we, we, we finally get to that which is never going to happen. But let's so Brandon, we're... your timing is absolutely perfect on this because a couple of people, even in this call, we've been having internal debates on exactly how do we do that? And I'm of the opinion, and I still, you know, Lewis and, and others in the, in the room can, can pose their perspectives, but I'm still of the opinion that we can do this with a single command uh, or a single um, a DNF command. I think we can do this all within the context of RPM installs and removes. A single uh, command, that is to say, not sudo bash. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> not, not curl pipe sudo bash. That would be bad, right? But I think we can do this with a DNF or a yum command um, to do. And now, uh, We've been going back and forth in terms of the race conditions and the catch-22 loops you get with regards to things like certificates, removing repos, adding repos. How do you manage the default configurations or, or rather the non-default configurations, right? As people have enabled or changed what repos that they are, um, they are pulling from and whatnot, and how do we manage that? And so we keep, we, we've been going back and forth on this as we've been doing technical brainstorms on this. But the gist of this is, we're gonna be able to do this. Uh, it, it's gonna be very easy. We will either provide a list of commands, a script, or you know, just copy paste this one DNF command or whatever we're gonna do. It's gonna be super simple. As a matter of fact, if there's one message that I could give to the largest audience possible, it would be this. If any organizations are currently on CentOS 8 and they're nervous about the end of life, which is coming at the end of this year, we got you covered. Enterprises from all over the world are working together with us to make sure that this is not going to be a problem. This will be a seamless, easy transition. That's the one message I wish I can get across to everybody. I was just in a call with, we were talking about a large telecom um, provider earlier with Rob. I was literally just on a call yesterday with a large telecom provider who basically said, we have been retooling our entire infrastructure to move to Ubuntu. And I said, well, what stops Canonical from doing what Red Hat just did? <laughs> and they said, yeah, that's a good point, um, nothing. I said, so why are you going in that direction? Because we didn't know Rocky existed. That was literally the context. I wish I could just, you know, how do we get the word out? I don't even know. I mean, can everyone go post on Reddit? I mean, <laughs> I, I thought your message was going to be Emacs and M4 are back. That's how you're going to move people from. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, but no thanks. I can tell you the first time I ever heard of Rocky Linux was uh, late last night when I got when I was reading my email and uh, uh, Jerry Feldman had sent me something about Rocky Linux. Jer Jerry's been getting the word out. All right. Thank you. Yeah, I, well, I looked at it and I called out, how are you, Greg? And, uh, you know, I was trying to track you down and I sent uh, an email to Brian and finally heard back from Brian. And uh, you cracked Brian up a few minutes ago. <laughs> he almost fell off his chair. Uh oh. But, but uh, yeah, basically, We've got to get the word out yeah. that, uh, you know, that there are replacements. So for the people, you know, I just have to make my son-in-law, uh, Brandon is actually from the uh, Smithsonian, uh, astrophysical. What is the astrophysics? The SAO. FAO, yeah. <clears throat> And they use a lot of uh, CentOS. 
Now, I haven't actually had a chance to look through your website yet. Uh, do you already have a, uh, an ISO set up I could download and install? Uh, or is that still a work in progress? So it, it is a work in progress. Um, the leader of the development team is here, uh, Lewis, who can um, definitely speak to this in more context than I can. But the, the gist of the message that I would really just kind of um, uh, go back and mention is that uh, we didn't start on day one trying to build an operating system. We knew that was the end goal, but that, that's, that was a short-sighted goal in my mind. The goal first, the first thing we have to solve is the infrastructure for that operating system such that we can build it reliably and we can build it in, and, and build it inclusively to the community. The last thing again that I wanted was another three to five person team like what they had with Pentos, right? I want anyone from dedicated developers to casual contributors to be able to say, hey, there's an update or, or we got a bug, how can we fix it? Um, and be able to get access to that Git. Um, now the term casual contributor may not be quite as casual as, as, as I'm hoping in this particular case, because we still need kind of a, um, a chain of trust and a chain of, of um, yeah, trust is probably the best word. Um, on how to how to do this. And so we've been talking a lot about um, the infrastructure and building that infrastructure. Um, so Neil and Taylor, um, I don't think Taylor's still here. I think he had to drop, but Neil's still here. Um, he's one of the leads on the infrastructure side in terms of how do we build that. And we now have the infrastructure set up such that from a Git repository, you simply commit your package, you commit your update, it automatically triggers CICD pipelines, it goes into a build cluster, it sets that up and does that build, it could do quali you know, QA, it could do testing, it could do signing, all within that infrastructure in a secure way that's highly reproducible and, and we can validate the integrity of that infrastructure. That to me is critically important because that creates the, the playing field that now developers can come and be part of what it is that we're building. And it also creates the playing field that we can even do more with it than just a, a simple rebuild. Like we have a lot of people that are interested in SIGs. We have a lot of people that are interested in doing kind of um, uh, value adds on top of the operating system. We were talking about legacy hardware a little bit ago. We have somebody who's gonna be leading a SIG uh, for legacy, which basically means we're going to be running a kernel that still has all the support enabled for all of the legacy hardware. Um, so we're going to have a legacy kernel available, but we're also going to have a bleeding edge kernel available for people who want to run on um, uh, people that want to run on, sorry, getting a call. So I'm just muting that people that want to run on like desktops and laptops, right? Getting, getting Linux to run on, on brand new laptops. is still kind of an ordeal uh, unless you have a brand new kernel. So things like that, right? We still have a lot of options and value that we want to add to the community and a lot of people that are interested. Another just quick example, embedded, right? We, we have a lot of people that are working with, you know, again, talking about the telcos, but we've got a lot of people that are really interested in embedded and, and having an embedded SIG. So this infrastructure gives us the ability to build all of this. And that's what our first goal was to create that. So do we have an ISO yet? It's a really long winded way, long winded excuse of saying, no, we don't have it yet. Um, we're working on it. Do you have some ideas about time frame for how long it'll be? Yeah, I'm gonna uh, hand the mic over to Lewis if he's uh, available. Okay. So in terms of timelines, um, I, I can't really give you like a definitive, like, hey, we're gonna have it by, you know, X, Y, Z time because when it, because when it comes to building operating systems, it's not easy. I, I think I think everyone can understand that it's not you know as cut and dry as we want it to be. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of massaging of the tools and a lot of like thinking required to actually you know do the thing that we want to do. So for the team that I'm leading, we've been working on an orchestration tool to actually help us with that, and uh, we've been actually importing repositories into our Git right now to get that part started. And um, we have our build system in place, but we're still finding some random stuff that we have to like add in and, and massage further because, you know, documentation doesn't like to, you know, exist, you know, in 2021. So we're having to deal with all that. What I'm hoping though, is that I, I at some point, you know, in this, you know, within the next month or two, I 
I really would like a release candidate that I that we could release and have people actually test and say like, hey, this works, this doesn't. Get the community rally behind us and like, you know, actually help us out, point out problems, point out bugs. Like, hey, this isn't installing right, or you know, because there's there could be anything that could come up. You know, just because we rebuild something doesn't mean it's going to work right the first time. And I've ran into that before. So I, I, I'm hoping for the next couple of months, I just can't give a, you know, a, a, def, a definite, um, I can't give a definite release date, unfortunately. I want to, but I just can't. I'll have to wait to use my jazz drive again. <laughs> I mean, I don't even know if I have a jazz drive anymore. <laughs> I have one in my attic, but I kind of doubt it works after all these uh, all these decades. Is that the old iOmega hard floppy cartridge thingy? That was the one that came after the zip drive. <laughs> zip drive, yeah. Wow, that's a good one. <laughs> we still have a machine at our organization that is being backed up nightly on a zip drive. I won't, I won't comment on um, why or anything, but it is still a critical piece of, of, of legacy equipment that is being backed up. On a zip drive. <laughs> yeah, we see that. Uh, we see that uh, Polaroid. I remember when the first CD burners came out. I suggested we start using CDs instead, and I got some pushback from that saying that would be really wasteful because our files aren't big enough to fill a whole, whole CD. And of course, my response to that was, "Well, a zip cartridge costs like what ten dollars, and a, a blank CD costs like ten cents per disc. So uh, who cares how uh, much wasted capacity there is?" Absolutely. How about audio tape? It works nicely. Um, actually, I had a question. I think it's it's uh, about Rocket Linux and maybe I think larger contribution in general. So as someone that wants to contribute to the community, um, like in the past, you know, I, I've gone to like say I'll go to like Freenode and be like, hey, I, I want to work on this and like I'll just get crickets. Um, like what do you, what would you suggest is the best way to get active as a contributor and kind of not, you know, as I said, you know, the beginning of the talk kind of just get drowned out. Um, but I think that was more slack than, than uh, anything. We, we, we did have a problem at the beginning. Um, having, you know, you can imagine having 10,000 people joining the slack all at once and then asking how, how can we help? What can we do? You know? And then, then the other half, basically just starting to do stuff it was actually a very difficult problem to, to manage. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not a manager. <laughs> I'm not a manager at all. I'm, a, I'm an engineer who sometimes pretends to be, a, you know, a, an, an executive <laughs> with my little startup. Um, but trying to figure out how to um, how to manage that a whole bunch of people wanting to help, wanting to be part of it was actually a problem. Um, and uh, it was something that we, we had to overcome, but it did take some time. And even now, I, I think what happened in the process of, of trying to overcome it was actually uh, somewhat detrimental to, to uh, a whole bunch of people wanting to help. And as you can imagine, um, you know, people came and they said, how can we help? What can we do? And there wasn't there wasn't a leadership set up yet. There wasn't a group of people, and I literally would take me hours to go from one side of Slack to the next, um, just trying to answer everybody who messaged me. And um, and then I would tell people, um, you know, send send me your information, or 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 you know, uh, you know, <laughs> let me get back to you in a little bit. And literally, the message would either disappear or they'd send it to me, and I, I would lose it because there was just too much. Um, so what ended up kind of happening naturally is uh, a couple things. First, we just created more and more channels in Slack. And wow. this sounds like a bad thing, but it's actually not. It actually ended up being a really good thing. So as more and more topics kind of came up, we started grouping like in similar interests together. And that was really good because what we kept doing is basically cutting the bisectional bandwidth of communication <laughs> every time we, we chunk this. And um, that gave us the ability to have smaller um, kind of what turned into teams. And in each one of these teams, there were certain individuals that uh, clearly just kind of assumed 
leadership positions. Wow. And they started, people started organizing things. People started uh, taking care of things. And we had a couple of people that started just going across the organization. And I'm not going to name now names because they're either listening or they're here with me now. But these are you know, fantastic, a tremendous group of people um, uh, just kind of just started doing this. And before we knew it, we even had a structure forming organically, right? And it's kind of interesting because, you know, and just to, just to, you know, kind of bring up just kind of the, the, the nature of what, what happened. We ended up with, um, you know, teams and these teams, we kind of now assign different roles to these teams. Each team has, you know, team leads, we have deputies and we have members and we've got a whole bunch of different teams and everybody's just basically part of the teams that they're most interested in. And that seems like that's the way that um, has worked out best so far. Now, along the way, we also tried a Google form to say, everybody who wants to help, go fill out this Google form. Sounds like a great idea. Yeah. Um, the problem with, with theory and practice is, you know, in, in, in theory, there's no difference between practice and theory, but in practice, there is, right? You have a thousand plus people all filling out this form and all of a sudden just going through that form is now a point of administration and you now have to go and respond to everybody, go check on everybody, figure out what they need to do. And it actually <laughs> ended up being a lot of work just in that. Now, it's still very valuable because periodically we're, we're, we say, God, you know, we really need somebody that has experience in blah, all right? We can now go to that, that backend database for that Google form or that spreadsheet, search for it and see who shows up and then reach out to them directly. So it has been very helpful. Unfortunately, um, it's also, it's very latency prone in the sense that somebody fills out something. In some cases, we don't even get a chance to get back to them ever. So they feel like it went into a black hole. I promise it didn't. Um, but at the same token, so I say that there's two ways to really join and, and be part of this. The first one is jump into Mattermost. Um, it's super easy if you haven't used it. Mattermost is an open source Slack alternative and it's fantastic. Uh, the company Mattermost even who's behind it, um, open source, going back to our conversation, open source, their core technology. They have enterprise support that you can get with it if you're interested, but um, it is it is open source, right? You can leverage it, you can install it yourself and run it. The clients are open source. That's what we're using. That company is backing us and actually even helping us to, to implement a lot of this and to manage this, which is fantastic. It's a great relationship that we have with them. Um, so join our matter most, uh, look for the different channels, just like in Slack, you, you, know, you look for the different channels or you can see all the channels, look for the channels that are most interesting to you in terms of where you wanna add value. And if you don't see anything that looks um, interesting there, or, or, or you see a hole or uh, a gap that we need to fill, which believe me, there are gaps we still need to fill. Bring this up in, in multiple channels. Um, people will see it. Uh, it's not like the initial influx that it was before. Um, people will see it now. Um, we'll be able to handle it. We'll be able to manage it. We'll be able to work with you much, much better at this point. And Mattermost has been tremendous in managing this because we're not losing messages anymore. Um, the second piece, of course, is to fill out that form. Uh, but for, for, for everybody here and anybody listening later, uh, please don't feel bad if we don't get back to you on that form right away. Uh, again, what we kind of use that for at this point is a list of skill sets of people um, that we can call upon if we ever need. Okay, very long-winded response again. As I told you guys, I've got no problem talking up constantly. So, sorry. <laughs> And I'll, and I'll and I'll add on too. I mean, we 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 constantly get people into at least the packaging channels and the, you know, the release engineering channels, and we actually have some people coming in trying to help one of my guys try to figure out dependency problems because we're trying to come up with the order in which stuff has to be built, and we got like four or five people helping us out with that, which is fantastic. And if anyone wants to help us with that, please <laughs> come on in and help us out with that. We could use all the help. We you know you know, we could get there. I mean, just, just participating and just seeing what we're doing and even just chatting and contributing is, is a huge amount of help. At least for me, it's a huge amount of help and, and it releases a lot of, uh, 
at least for me, it releases a lot of pressure off of off of my shoulders trying to figure it out all by myself. I I'd, I'd rather have a team, you know, and a group of people working at it at once. So that's and just for my side. And even just joining and just like Lewis said, and just joining and just chatting with people, just talking with people, you kind of see the ropes, you see what's happening, and it's just a matter of time before as new people come in. You already know what to tell them. You know what you know how to direct them. You know where everything is, and that is super super helpful because um, we did it, it, it. It's not wasn't just you, Chris. I'm sure we lost a lot of fantastic people who want to be part of this project. And again, maybe there's two messages I wish I can get out to the world, and that would be the other one. Um, uh, don't lose faith in us. Come back. We are we are building an open community, and we want everybody to be part of this. Thank you, Craig. Uh, Laurie asked a question on the uh, chat. Why do you think that proprietary tools caught on so much in the open source world? Is there a reason open source developers can't make better tools than proprietary developers? Do we fail to get user requirements and user expectations? Do we feel have making marketing volunteers doing market research? Well, <laughs> the, the I'd, 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 I'd quite like to speak to this if, if that's at all. You know what, Hayden, go for it. Yep. Um, hi, I'm, uh, I'm Hayden. I am currently the, the web and the design uh, lead on the project. You can probably tell I'm not from, uh, <laughs> from anywhere near Boston. <laughs> but I, I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to speak on this because this is something that um, I ended up discussing a lot with people sort of towards the beginning of the project. I think that the problem with a lot of the open source tooling is either the, the sort of the user experience um, isn't as good um, or it doesn't have sort of the same core feature set that a certain, you know, proprietary tool might have. You know, or, or in some cases, it, because it's open source, but it's been made by an individual, that software might have been good, you know, three years ago, but because it's been made by an individual and that person hasn't had time to, to work on it for ages, it's just sort of gone unmaintained. Um, and at that point, it would require a lot of work to, to sort of continue going. Um, I, I think one, I think the key example here um, for us, I mean, obviously we, we did go with the open source alternative, but one of the main uh, like sort of solutions that we were looking at was for our sort of the uh, overarching project like issue tracking. So the, the initial discussion, uh, basically the immediate assumption was, you know, Atlassian has an open source offering, let's speak to them. Um, and, you know, and, and for the large part, I was, I was in agreement with that. You know, they have a good set of tools. They integrate with a lot of other services. If we need to, you know, bring our GitHub issues over to, to you know, a Jira instance, for example, um, or if we wanted to host all our documentation in the same place as our issues, that sort of thing. You know, the proprietary solutions are a lot more likely to provide those sorts of features than the, the open source offerings usually are. Um, so I, I think, uh, you know, it, coming back to what I said earlier, in a lot of cases, it does come down to sort of how many other services either are in the same ecosystem as the proprietary software or are in the sort of same level of integration, um, which it, I, I, feel, I feel user experience and, and integration are sort of the, the main failings of, of the open source alternatives in a, in a lot of cases. I was just looking at the chat and Christoph, um, three nineties. <laughs> I don't know. What was it? 20 years at this point, uh, there was a, um, an S three ninety emulator called Hercules. So you, you could actually run, uh, IBM mainframe stuff on Intel x86 with this emulator. 
So we're going to bring that back. Port it to Rocky. Uh, somebody's, somebody's generating a lot of background noise. I think that's Hayden. There we go. It got Sorry about that. White, it got to be white noise. I stopped hearing it. Isn't that weird? Maybe there's some weird feedback loop with my uh, mic or something. Yeah, it's specifically coming from you, Hayden. No, it's it's just a soft white noise in the background. Uh, no okay. Like a hiss. It's very calming and soothing to hear. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I can I can leave it on for you know as long as I uh, stay in the meeting if uh, if that's something people want. <laughs> uh, um, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, just, I, I had a question. Uh, I figured the uh, the sounds be good a good opportunity to ask it. So, um, so me like I I've been a Linux admin slash desktop slash sysadmin slash devops, um, you know, since '99, and and I just recently um, decided to go back to school, and I'm gonna try to to change careers to software development. Um, and I guess my my plan is to, um, in, in in lieu of getting hired because I have experience using contributing to open source to have that to generate that experience. Um, but at the same time, it's like, um, uh, like I, I know enough to be dangerous um, in terms of, of programming. <laughs> um, but like, where where do you think would be a good place um, to, to start? That is an absolutely brilliant question. I know I've talked a lot, but I just, I, I wanna respond to that um, because it's such a big, such a big deal. Um, it, it's, it's hard for people to get experience to put on their resumes, right? If they want to go to a different job or they want to do something different in many cases you know it's all about work experience open source has absolutely changed that paradigm granted this was in the 90s um, but you know my first linux job my actually a lot of my first jobs um, in computing wasn't because i had work experience and heck my, my degree is in biochemistry so i had no computing experience but it was because i was in the open source community and i can put things on my resume in terms of projects that I'm working with, um, even hobbies that I'm that I'm messing around with, um, and that was valuable. The look, I, I I'm hopeful that Rocky is going to take over for Centos. I'm hopeful it's going to be as successful as Centos, um, maybe even more. And if that's the case, I can say everybody who's working on it, all of the contributors, all of the people that are that are um, being part of this, whether you're sitting in the in the in the matter most and you're helping to direct people, you're helping to manage, whether you are developing as a core contributor or whether you're just watching and slowly learning, and eventually you 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 gain enough knowledge that you can now be an effective uh, team member. Putting that on your resume. Yeah. Assuming that again, just making a big assumption that Rocky does in fact take off, and I think it's pretty safe to assume at this point that it, it's going to take off. All of a sudden, puts you in a very different category to other people that are applying for the same job, right? You have core operating, so you're, you're on the team, you're on the Rocky team, and that team is that that that's going to be very valuable. And I can tell you, as an employer, these are things I look for. Um, when I'm when I'm looking at candidates, people that have not only the work experience, um, I mean, education is nice as well as so, so certifications, but I'm really looking for experience. And that experience does not have to be from a job. That experience could absolutely be from an open source project um, that you're part of. And like what um, what group usually hand like say like if you're you're making the OS builds um, you know like I, I mean I've 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 kind of played around with Linux from scratch and stuff but I've always been kind of interested in how how do you take um, all of the compiled code and, and kind of built it into an operating system image like do, is there a particular team that that handles that Yep, yep. Lewis right here is is leading that effort. Okay. 
And yeah. Is there a channel on Mattermost? Um, yep. There, there's several of them. Yeah. So we yeah, have we, we have a few. There's there's dev packaging, dev general, and dev anaconda. Most of what's going on right now is in dev packaging. Um and that's the one that we're the most active in right now. Okay. It's it's actually kind of funny that you ask because part of the whole, you know, how do we wrap this all into an operating system? Um, just besides having a bunch of RPMs put together um, is part of what we're discussing right now and trying to figure out. So absolutely need some help with that. Cool. So what was that again? The um, uh, dev image was that? Uh, dev slash packaging is how we have it named in the matter most right now. And then the yeah. Anaconda one? The... Yeah, it, yeah, like all the dev channels start with dev oh, okay. slash. Yeah, okay. so you, you should actually be able to, when you click, I forget what button it is, but you, you click a button and then you can actually do dev slash in the search box and you'll be able to see all the channels we got for for development. All right, cool. I'd also like to point out that um, obviously all, all of the respective teams also have their own channels on on the Manamost. So if if anyone is interested in in helping with a specific thing, like Greg said earlier, you know, it, there's either go, already going to be a Manamost channel for it, or you know, one could be suggested as a, a hole we need to fill. I might throw in a. a couple of bullet items on the topic of you know, kind of career building in open source, you know, getting involved in a project, contributing code, great, great opportunities. It's what you want. Um, but also participating in forums like this, you know, you find your local user groups, you give a presentation, just kind of get your feet wet, actually addressing the community. And then as your kind of as your catalog of topics and your expertise builds, eventually you wind up submitting, pro, you know, uh, sessions to, an expo or something like that. You know, those are other ways you kind of expand your audience and, and build your brand, if you will, if you want to call it that way. Yeah, I can't agree agree more. Um, you know, one of the things that's really kind of interesting is out of all of the, you know, the, the years that I've been doing open source, I mean, you know, if you go back to the 90s, even into the 2000s, you know, th there still was kind of underground rising of open source projects, right? That kind of came out of, you know, nowhere and people just solving good problems and just a, a group of people just focusing on uh, making cool stuff. We, we, we oh. packed auditoriums to teach people how to compile Apache and MySQL. Yeah. Yes, yes. And <laughs> that, that's kind of, it, it, in a way, it's kind of gone away. Um, in, in, I'd say the last 10 to 15 years, it's been kind of shrinking, right? There's been a much less involvement in, in kind of the traditional open source kind of underground movements. And I think the conditions were just perfectly set between COVID lockdowns and, 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 you know, congrats to everyone younger than me, but the newer generation of people <laughs> that basically want to, <laughs> thanks Jordan, <laughs> rub it in. Um, and the, this younger generation that wants to actually kind of experience that open source kind of evolution that, that I got to experience when I was just entering my career, I'm starting to see that again. And Rocky, in, in all of my years in open source, I've never seen a project form like Rocky Formed, right everything else it's it's a, a person or a couple people they get an idea they start they start working on this idea they post it up to, to github or or fresh meat if you want to go back into the day um anybody here remember fresh meat um yeah <laughs> um fresh, fresh, fresh meat absolutely <laughs> I'm, I'm 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 afraid to say i don't remember anything beyond i don't remember anything older than uh, github <laughs> yeah how about Dacus? Nope. What was it? Say it again. Dekus. No, I don't know it. Digital. <laughs> but oh, and, and, and before Dekus, IBM Share. Oh, yeah. Mm. I remember you was that uh, fight on that uh, bit net. Oh, no, these these predated that. Yeah, I remember Fido. Yeah, I remember Fido. 
So, but, but all of a sudden, I mean, we're, we're just seeing like a, a kind of a replay of history happening right here. And I've not seen it ever with Rocky, right? Uh, that, as I have with Rocky, because all of a sudden overnight, thousands and thousands of people are all on board. And I mean, not even with, if, if you remember when, you know, Oracle completely, oh, can I say this? Um, Oracle um, changed and pivoted MySQL in a, <laughs> in a way that was not quite so friendly. Um, when that happened, all of a sudden, right, you had, you had the MariaDB community spin up like that. But even that was nowhere near as voracious as this was. So what we just saw and what we just witnessed is, is I mean, it's going to be an open source history. I, mean, I don't know if that sounds melodramatic, but you get what I'm saying. It's, it's, it's a big deal. I've never seen anything like this happen. And we really do. We have this kind of underground feeling of uh, this movement in terms of what we're building. And it's actually it's really super exciting. And it's giving people um, that ability to, to be part of that sort of thing and to be able to put things on their resume and be able to build up experience for their career and for their lives um, about this. And I, I think it's tremendous. I think it's fantastic. I mean, this is one of the reasons why I'm so absolutely excited to be part of this. I think I'd, I'd like to speak to that as well because um, being in, in the position I am, I've, I've sort of, I, I've never really known a time, um, or at least <laughs> not in memory, where you know that there are big, you know, heavily used pieces of, of enterprise software that you can just go and download and and deploy onto a VM that you can run on your PC. Uh, and, and play around with, and then you know contribute back to. So it's 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 very, it's 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 good to know that that sort of thing is is sort of becoming commonplace. Well, I think also that I mean in this in this day and age, um, because of uh, DevOps or, or even um, software testing, that like. Um, you know, back back in the '90s, you know, you you put a disk in a um, put a disk in a, in a computer, and then install um, uh, the operating system or use Semantic Ghost. Um, I don't know if anyone remembers Semantic Ghost, um, but like uh, now, people, you know, I I can just use Vagrant and like fire up, um, you know, a hundred VMs or as many, depending on how much uh, CPU memory I have. Um, where now it seems like operating systems are so ephemeral um, because you can create, you can spin them up so fast that it seems like there's less sense in kind of the licensing structure that proprietary operating systems have now. Uh, although, I mean, I know that the, um, I, I think rel was kind of different because you had the satellite um, and you, I think you, you manually handled your licensing through that, um, but but still having that you know that freeness to to manage such a large uh, you know glob of of instances is is really needed these days. You, you want to hear something interesting? Is I, I know a lot of very large HPC sites that actually have purchased Red Hat Enterprise Linux but refuse to actually use it. Um, they've purchased Red Hat Linux, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, so they can call on support if they ever need. But they refuse to deal with the entitlements and licenses that Red Hat Enterprise Linux imposes. So they actually run CentOS, and they just basically pretend it is it is Red Hat when they call support. Oh, oh um, that sucks. <laughs> yeah, actually, you brought up a question. Um, uh, this is just kind of a general question and asking people like, uh, is anyone here a forming user as a satellite alternative? Sort of, sort of. Sort of yes. I, I still have an instance running. Sort of. Like, um, it seems like by default, Foreman requires a client certificate to authenticate to access the mirror. Um, is anyone else seeing that? Or did it just... Wait, what do you mean, like, like a client that's connected to Foreman, or yeah, are you pulling? Okay, you set up a mirrors, um, and you register a machine using RHN register, um, and you know that machine gets the the file with all the yum mirrors, 
um, like the one test in uh, test instance I have. So it went to go to these yum mirrors, but for some reason those yum mirrors on pulp are requiring a, a, a client certificate uh, um, so, for the SSL uh, handshake. I don't have any experience with Foreman, um, but in satellite, if you add content that's not from Red Hat, then you typically have to go create a product for that content to oh, sit in. Okay. And then I think there is a, a basically like you, you have to create like a account. You can make it infinite or whatever. Um, and that way you can kind of in the same way you would meter something that from Red Hat, you would meter it as an open source, but you could make it infinite. So you, you it would never be said it, a client would never be turned down for access. So that maybe that's what it's related to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Yeah. I forgot about the product thing. Yeah. You have to do the product and the repos and basically combine that into one thing. And then you basically and you add, that, add that, add that, add that as a, yeah, add that as a subscription or whatever to the, the client. So they wait that way they can enable the repositories or however. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Uh, I, I have to get going, but I just want to say thanks. Thanks to the Red Hat and Rocky guys. No problem. Thanks for joining. And um, actually, before I go do my homework, I'm gonna go say hi in the in the Madam Rose channels, um, and then I gotta go do my trick homework. And I just wanna say, anyone that does open source signal processing has my utmost respect because trig sucks. It really sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank right, you, Chris. Have a good night. Thanks, Chris. You too. Bye. -bye. So Jabber, um, next month, uh, I think we were talking about having me present again. Um, I'll probably do a, uh, or I think we were proposing a, a rel eight kind of update. So it'd be 8.3, maybe on 8.4 beta. Um, and we'll, we'll give uh, Rob another half hour to kind of talk about the, um, the developer subscriptions. Cause we talked about what, what sent us and how that changed. Uh, and now we're going to, you know, the next piece will be how we're talking about the developer subscriptions and how we can address, the, you know, people that need access to more RHEL for development purposes and stuff like that. Right. Sounds good. Can you send me the details? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Christoph, after this, I'd love to have your contact information and so we can bounce some ideas back and forth uh, between us and your role at Red Hat as well. Uh, would you mind shooting me an email too? I'm in sales. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the enemy. <laughs> well, no. No, you, you fooled me. You fooled me. Your, your, your technical chops are plenty. Um, yeah. I, I'd still appreciate the contact. Uh, no, you bet. I'll, I'll put it in chat. <laughs> are you really in sales, man? Yeah, I'm a sales engineer. <laughs> wow. I, I must be good at it. Uh, <laughs> that means he helps people. <laughs> yeah. like, he helps I, me spend money. I can attest he's in sales. He was my sales rep years ago. <laughs> yeah, but we knew him before he was in sales. Okay. <laughs> I paid for a lot of good lunches. <laughs> yeah, and I, I sales then if you have an expense account. <laughs> well, Christoph, it'd still be great to uh, touch base with you. Thank you. GMK, really? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was either that or Greg. <laughs> no, he's he's laughing because uh, this is Gordon. Uh, my initials are also GMK. <laughs> oh, oh, so it's not, it's not just the G and the K that's throwing me. Your initials are GMK too. That's, Correct. What? What? I gotta ask. What's your middle name? Michael. Yep. Same here. <laughs> <laughs> That's too funny. That you, hilarious. You can actually configure your account on uh, on Jitsi to use Gravatar. You just put the email address up on get the Gravatar in the uh, in your profile. Let's assume you know, you've set up an icon on Gravatar for your uh, for your avatar. Uh, I have not yet. No, it's very simple to set up. I highly recommend it. 
Hey, I've got to drop off because I've got a three-year-old that I can hear upstairs. But thanks, guys, for the information. This has been really, really helpful. And I'm, I'm, I'm getting the stuff from Mattermost and stuff now. But this has been really helpful for our CentOS possible someday transition moment. So thanks again. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to meet everybody. I'm going to drop as well here. I have a six o'clock meeting that I'm going to jump into in here in just a little bit. I uh, just wanted to say thank you and thank you for letting me hog the mic so much and talk. Um, if anybody does want me, you know, my email I just put in, it's GMK at Rocky. <laughs> <laughs> Gordon, if you get a position with us, we're going to have to come up with another, another email for you. I guess I'll have to be GMK too. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was then we have an email list for you, GMKs. It was fantastic to meet you, everybody. And um, please, everybody's welcome to join us on Mattermost. Um, and if you, you know, I'd, I'd love to, to stay in touch and also watch these videos too. Is you know, it was a great experience. I had a lot of fun here. Thank you. That's a good group here. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks for dinner and a beer.